Society. Um, the topic tonight is on spirit possession. I think everybody knows the drill better than I do. So uh, over to you, Ian, to do the intro. Thank you, Ed. Um, this one was done in a bit of a rush, so um, but I hope you all get something out of it. Um, okay, so... Um, a persistent belief um, throughout history and across cultures is that living and non-living things um, become possessed by spirits. And so a person or an object still looks the same, but the controlling principle has radically altered. You know, something else is taking control. And speaking broadly, there are two categories of spirit possession, uh, positive and negative. So positive possession is, is desired, it's wanted, and the possessed individual typically doesn't experience any distress, and the wider community uh, typically approves. Um, examples would be um, Christians who are filled with the Holy Spirit and therefore lead especially virtuous lives, um, ancient divine kingship where the human king is simultaneously the incarnation of a god, um, ecstatic examples of ecstatic communion, uh, masks, possession rituals, and so on. Negative possession isn't wanted, right? So the possessed is distressed and, and suffers. Um, the behaviours are dysfunctional, and the wider community typically disapproves. And the best example of that would be demon possession. And so anthropologists distinguish between um, emic and etic analyses. And so an emic analysis takes the perspective of a cultural insider. Um, you know, we try to understand what it would be like to be a member of, of the culture under analysis. Etic, on the other hand, an etic analysis takes the outsider's perspective and where we try to understand the broader meaning of a particular culture in the context of many others, including our own. So to begin, I want to consider uh, some examples of spirit possession from the insiders, the emic uh, point of view. So today, um, in certain parts of Central and Southern Africa, there are cultures that regularly engage in possession rituals that involve wearing sacred masks. And you know, there's lots of regional variation, but a typical pattern is that um, ancestor or nature spirits um, communicate in dreams uh, to, to demand to be incarnated as masks, and the mask making is performed by um, a, a priestly caste, and the mask wearers during the rituals that involve uh, dancing and, and music, they embody the spirit, they become possessed by the spirit's character and the act accordingly. Uh, between rituals, these masks are carefully stored, venerated, uh, maintained, and you know some masks uh, considered to become so powerful that simply looking at them would risk uh, being possessed. Uh, now, we've got no idea really of the um, cultural beliefs of early humans, but mass wearing is very, very ancient. And so it's possible that uh, possession rights uh, could be equally ancient. And so, for example, there's, um, and there's people here know this better than I do, that there's hundreds of monstrous uh, human-animal hybrids called therianthropes, which are depicted in Paleolithic uh, cave paintings. Um, you know, humanoids with, with bird-like and antelope heads. And we don't know what these beings are, but one possible explanation is that they are shamans wearing ritual masks. And um, we've actually discovered uh, ritual masks uh, from the later Neolithic period actually preserved in caves. Um, so, you know, to hunt successfully requires understanding and predicting animal behaviour. You know, the hunter needs to take the animal's perspective, at least to think like them, in order to find them and trap them. And so perhaps this need to emulate prey, to temporarily think and act as a different kind of being, was a precursor to shamans you know, wearing masks, becoming possessed by animal spirits in formal hunting rituals before the hunting proper began. But, you know, this is so long ago, uh, we can only, only guess, really. But the oldest evidence of possession dates from ancient Egypt in the 4th century BC. And it's a stele from the city of Karnak, which tells how 
Ramesses, the second sister-in-law, Bentresh, becomes stricken with a demon. Uh, she loses control of her limbs. Uh, Ramesses summons the god Khonsu, which means, appropriately, smiter of evil spirits, and, and cures her. And as many of us here know, ancient, ancient Egypt, antiquity, was full of spirits. Temple statues were incarnation of gods. Statues of dead pharaohs held um, you know, the ancestor spirits, allowing them to continue to observe the living. And during the Old Kingdom, the pharaohs were divine kings. In ancient Greece, they also believed in gods and also lesser spirits, which they called uh, daemons. Um, so a bunch of examples from ancient Greece. Um, the muses were goddesses of artistic and scientific creativity. Uh, Plato's Phaedrus tells how they could possess um, a virgin soul and inspire them to passionate expression of lyric poetry, which is a kind of, you know, kind of creative madness possessed by the muses. Uh, Socrates, in Plato's Apology, he reveals that since his early childhood, he had lived with an inner voice that is a sign from God, um, a daemonion or daemon. And the voice warns him whenever he's about to commit an error, uh, such as entering politics. Uh, <laughs> he also claims that, uh, begin, quote, begin quote, the sweetness and blessedness of this possession, end quote, enabled him to become a true uh, philosopher. So Socrates, the philosopher, viewed himself as a semi-possessed individual. And the ancient Greeks willingly entered trans states to become possessed by deities. Uh, the high priestess of the temple of Apollo at Delphi, the, the Oracle of Delphi, entered a trans state by inhaling vapors. And once possessed by the divine, revealed hidden knowledge. And gaining uh, oracular or supernatural powers by spirit possession wasn't restricted to ancient Greece. You can find examples in ancient Chinese and Hindu literature, and the practice continues to this day. So mentioning just a few that happen now. Um, female ecstat ecstatics of the Igbo people of Nigeria. Uh, the Nichung Oracle, who is an oracular priest of Tibet, which the Dalai Lama sometimes consults and enters a trans state to... Um, give hidden knowledge and advice. Uh, modern occultists, uh, some of whom explicitly recreate ancient Greek possession rites and um, speak as, as gods, become possessed by gods, mediums of various kinds. It's very much with us today. In the Iliad, um, warriors became possessed by Ares and they attained a state of, of wolfish rage and they foam at the mouth like a mad dog. And uh, again, this kind of martial ecstasy uh, wasn't restricted to ancient Greece. Uh, Old Norse berserkers, they became possessed by a bear spirit. They'd howl and growl and attack with, with bestial fury. Old Irish literature, um, the Tain, I think, describes uh, the warp spasm where the warrior intoxicated with, with battle rage and encouraged by the spirits of the valley monstrously distorts their body to achieve superhuman strength. And if anyone's a fan of 2000 AD here, uh, which probably isn't, but uh, the slaying the warrior is based on the old Irish myths and the, and the artwork of the warp spasm is, is fantastic. It's, it's great. Okay. Um, so, uh, but, you know, monotheistic cultures are also full of spirits and spirit possession. Uh, according to Christian belief, demons are fallen angels that thwart God's plans by inviting humans to sin. In the Old Testament, Saul is possessed by an evil spirit, becomes frenzied and violent. Uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls describe demons entering the body. Uh, it, most demons in the Bible, it turns out, are, are kind of medical nuisances, which is common to early Indo-European and Semitic cultures. Demons are the cause of illness in ancient Sumerian and Mesopotamian incantation and exorcism tablets. But the actual demon possession where, where you're controlled by demons is, is rarer. There's, there's five cases in the New Testament. Um, and typically, the demoniac falls down at Jesus' approach, and the indwelling demon, speaking through the human host, recognizes Jesus as the Son of God, um, and Jesus then drives him out with his power, sometimes into animals such as pigs that then go mad. And... Importantly, Jesus has the power of exorcism because he is also possessed. 
Um, in the Bible, during his baptism, the heavens open, the Holy Spirit descends in the form of a dove and then remains with him. And subsequently, Jesus refers to himself as the Son and the God as the Father. And Jesus states that he's possessed by the Holy Spirit. In, in, in John, he states that I and my Father are one, and, uh, but then the assembled crowd um, throw stones at him for blasphemy. Um, so uh, Christianity is founded on spirit possession. And the precise nature of this possession and, and how Christ can be both a man and a God, a divine king, obviously has vexed um, Christian theologians for quite some time. So uh, the Christian God, either as the Holy Spirit or the Son, can possess many things, both living and non-living. In the Eucharist, ordinary bread and wine become possessed with additional spiritual properties. Um, Christians want Christ to be present in their lives. Uh, Paul, the apostle, declared that uh, I no longer live, but Christ lives in, in me. And then he encouraged Christians to, again, quote, put on the mind of Christ. Um, during the Pentecostal event, um, described in the New Testament, the Holy Spirit possesses a, a whole room full of um, Christ followers who then start speaking in tongues. And the modern Pentecostal movement, which claims to have over 250 million members worldwide, believes that the Holy Spirit can, can fill them, and once spirit-filled, they do also speak in tongues and perform divine healing, uh, just as the early Christians did. Um, Christian priests in the medieval period, uh, they occasionally battled... Um, demons in exorcism rites. Um, the exorcist, or the adjurer, it was an official position in the church hierarchy and meant he who reads over the insane and ill. Uh, in medieval England, um, it seems that uh, demon possession flourished in the late 7th century in Northumbria and Anglia. And this was the golden age of monastic culture in England. And so we had a militant form of Christianity coming into contact with, with latent pagan beliefs in the rural population. And um, I'm going to give you one example um, that's recorded in Felix's Life of St. Gothlac, written around 735 AD. So a youth is, is stricken by an evil spirit and, and becomes mad, lacerating his own limbs with, with wood and iron and, and biting his own nails and teeth. Uh, the possession gets worse. He tears and bites at others. He gains supernatural strength that can't be restrained. Three men try to bind him, and the youth picks up a, a double-edged battle axe and with gleeful blows kills them. Um, but he isn't blamed um, for these deaths because it's the demon that's responsible. He's not responsible. The, so the youth spends the next four years at home with his parents, in a state of devastation, hardly able to eat, he becomes emaciated, he becomes broken. And his parents, desperate, uh, take him to the local priest who bathes him in holy water. Uh, but this doesn't work, so the problem ascends a spiritual hierarchy. And the youth is taken, limbs bound, to Guthlac's island, where he lives as a holy hermit. Guthlac prays and fasts for three days. Then he cleanses the youth with holy water, and finally... Blowing a breath of healing into his face repels the demon, and um, Felix states that from that time to his dying day, he did not suffer anxiety from the vexation of that evil spirit again. So these successful exorcisms uh, demonstrated you know, the truth and the power of Christianity, and if the evidence is sketchy, but if, if, if accurate, it seems that the frequency of demonic possession reduced once the rural population became fully Christianized and various dramatic uh, pathologies were tend to be interpreted as medical rather than demonic. Okay, so that's like a whirlwind tour of um, spirit possession across cultures and across the ages. And it's impossible to, um, it's, it's, you know, once you start looking at it, it's absolutely everywhere, um, even more so than I would have thought, um, everywhere. And it's, 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 and it's alive today. And if you're inclined, you could attend a spirit possession ritual in this country, and you can watch them on YouTube as well if you want. And there's plenty of them. So let me now turn to um, non-spiritual explanations of these phenomena. 
And so now I'm going to take this etic, the outsider's uh, point of view. So obviously there's, there's a clear link between certain illnesses and uh, forms of negative possession. So antique and medieval thinkers, they, they did distinguish between mental and physical illness and demon possession proper. Evil spirits were only invoked typically if the hidden cause of the symptoms showed that the symptoms showed the presence of an alien controlling entity, another kind of sentient thing. Uh, and so the illnesses that were more, more likely to be classified as demon uh, possession would be things like intractable muscle control disorders and, and, and certain kinds of behavioral disorders. And in, in historical cases, we can only guess at what the underlying pathology might have been, but uh, you know, candidates would, in, would be you know, cross-cultural, physiologically um, caused dysfunctions, uh, things like paralysis, uh, sh strokes, you know, faces can, can become contorted and, and limbs stop working. Um, rabies, uh, viral disease, that causes sufferers to become frenzied, gain overwhelming strength, foam at the mouth, fear the water, it's really weird, the fear, the presence of water, uh, vomit, and that's consistent with some of the, these historical cases. But rabies, if you get it, you're going to die. It's incurable even today, so that wouldn't account for um, successful exorcisms. Uh, Tourette's syndrome um, is relatively common uh, neurodevelopmental disorder. Uh, you get physical and verbal tics, I think most people know this. Uh, including repeating what others say, echolalia, and swearing and insulting others in completely inappropriate ways, um, coprolalia. And that fits perfectly some of the scenarios. Uh, a Tourette sufferer is like Jekyll and Hyde, one minute perfectly normal, suddenly starts shouting and swearing. Um, and so perhaps many of the exorcists, thinking they were battling an indwelling demon, um, you know, hurling profanities at, at God and Christ, like we see in the movies, was in fact dealing with a sufferer of Tourette's syndrome. Um, but the most promising candidate for demon possession is, is epilepsy. Uh, and in ancient Greece, it was called the, the sacred disease. And Hippocrates, he tried to argue it was caused not by daemons, but by the imbalance of humans, humors that cause, quote, blockage of cerebral phlegmatic vessels, end quote. Not that explanation, really. Epilepsy varies greatly between individuals. Symptoms include jerking, falling to the ground, foaming, biting the tongue and lip, sudden discharge of the bowels and bladder, speech impairment, hallucinations, feelings of intense fear. Um, but these episodes sometimes can be goal-directed, so people can automatically you know, undress or, or cook, and then when they get over it, they don't remember what they've done. Um, and the episodes are sporadic, so a few minutes of, of prayer, incantation, dousing with holy water might actually accidentally appear effective. So epilepsy is, is a good candidate for many of these negative possession states. So that's um, negative possession. Let's now turn to some of the uh, non-spiritual non explanations for positive possession. So, as mentioned, positive possession is desired, it's wanted. And so humans have developed technologies to reliably try and begin, manage, and terminate um, spirit possession. And one of the most important and ancient control technologies is the sacred mask. Um, and, and why? So a mask obviously hides the identity of the individual from the community. Wearing a mask is, is freeing in that sense. And it's a social signal, a very clear social signal, that the individual is playing a new kind of social role. And the masked rite is, is, a, is a social context, a, a well-defined social context, a festival, a rite, a ceremony, where new conventions and rules come into play. And if you actually believe the mask is an incarnation, incarnation of a powerful spirit, then simply putting it on might profoundly affect you in that context. And how it looks, how the mask looks, whether it portrays a demon, a god, animal spirit, that affects how others react to you 
and they will behave as if you are the spirit of the mask. That's the convention of the um, social situation, and that can be highly reinforcing. It's kind of like a positive feedback loop. So another important technology is the use of naturally occurring psychoactive substances. There's many of these, hundreds, but you know, somewhat carver, tobacco, hemp, uh, mushrooms, various nerve toxins that can extract from plants and, and animals. And uh, it's well known that shamanic traditions use psychoactive substances to stimulate their spiritual experiences. The Pythian priestess at Delphi probably chewed the leaves and inhaled the smoke of the oleander shrub, and that induces symptoms similar to epilepsy. Uh, Norse berserkers may have consumed um, the henbane plant to, to help them become possessed. And as, as many of us know, uh, today Native American religious rites include the consumption of mescaline, which is a hallucinogen extracted from the um, peyote cactus. Uh, in Gabon and Cameroon, um, initiates of the Bwiti religion consume the root bark of, a, of the Tabernathna iboga plant and they dance in order to get, get um, in altered states of consciousness and, and dance and commune with an ancestor spirits. So this link between psychoactive substances and, and positive possession states goes hand, hand in hand. There's lots of examples of it. And when we combine hallucinogenic uh, drugs with, with mass wearing, the combined effect could be tremendously powerful because imagine, imag your imagination and reality will dissolve into each other and you know, your belief systems will become visible to your eyes in, in front of you. Uh, and other techniques include things like repetition, uh, music, dance, and chanting, and that forces your mind to a different mode. Um, a good example would be Sufi whirling, uh, originated in the 13th century, practiced today. Uh, many of you have sure seen it. You repeatedly spin around in a circle for hours, um, accompanied by music and reciting a prayer. And the explicit aim is to get to a closer union with, with Allah. And mystics throughout the ages experimented with fasting, sleep deprivation, sexual abstinence, self-mutilation, and you know, um, advanced deep meditation techniques to atti attain um, directly, directly experience the divine, um, get closer to um, whatever it may be. So what seems common to all those techniques is that they aim to dissolve the ego, to empty the mind of its usual everyday contents and make space uh, for something else, something alien, something that is not at all like the ordinary you. Uh, but I, I think we shouldn't focus too much on the spiritual techniques and, and ecstatic states because many examples of positive possession, um, which we can see today, we can, we can, it happens today, they don't require masks, they don't require drugs or meditation, they simply require strongly held beliefs. Um, many young children sincerely believe that the red robe figure they see at the shopping mall is a magical being with extraordinary powers. Many religious people sincerely believe that God communicates to them as an inner voice. Uh, modern occultists and mediums, they sincerely believe they summon spirits into rooms and into themselves. Uh, Pentecostal faith healers sincerely believe they're conduits of God's power and those that actually receive the laying on of hands they sincerely believe sometimes that they're actually healed and uh, Pentecostalists have a, a saying which is this, which is faith in the Lord is the key to receiving healing uh, which is another way of saying that you know, magic works best if you fully and genuinely believe it to be true. So belief in spirit possession seems to be a necessary condition for the phenomenon of spirit possession, but sometimes it also seems to be a sufficient condition for it. So why do people have these beliefs at all? Why do us human beings tend to believe in spirits and being possessed by them? Um, so here's my stab at answering that question. So you know, we, we naturally distinguish between the immediate experience of our own mind and, and the sensuous experience of our own body. 
And minds are a different sort of thing to bodies. We can find hearts, lungs, muscles and brains inside us and in and other, other bodies. But we never find minds, because minds are the sort of thing that can't be seen or touched. And this conceptual dualism can easily imply that the mind and body can exist separately. And in this kind of theoretical worldview, um, our minds, we, are also spirits or souls that are conditionally, conditionally rather necessarily united with our bodies. And that means that other spirits, which might like bodies altogether, also exist, could also exist and could also take control. And today we would invoke uh, the unconscious, chemical imbalances, viral infections, diseases, multiple personality disorder, all that kind of stuff to explain different kinds of loss of identity. But in the past, obviously, spirit possession played that explanatory role. But one twist is that our theories, our beliefs about what's happening, have real effects. So ancient sufferers of Tourette's and the wider community may have all believed in demon possession and acted accordingly. And in that sense, the theory becomes uh, self-reinforcing. Another ability that we have is the ability to adopt uh, the perspective of other people, other animals and, and even other things, and then try to think what it might be like to be them. You know, we have this implicit theory of how other minds work. And so in a sense, we can simulate alien perspectives. But our, our personal identity, who we are, who we were, who we hope to be, that's also, in a sense, a mental simulation of a kind, you know, one that happens to be active when we're awake and stops when we sleep. So our fully awake self, our sense of identity that all of us have right now, comes and goes. And it's really only one of many possible identities that we could execute. And some people have obviously developed that capability into an, into an art form. Um, professional actors, they're very good at temporarily adopting a completely different persona. They, they strive to become the characters they play. You know, that's not a supernatural visitation, but in the past, the least were different about this. So Greek theatre, uh, invented somewhere some, sometime in the 6th century BC, seems to be an evolution of archaic masked possession rites. And in fact, some traditional forms of Asian theatre they still explicitly maintain the link between spirit possession and acting. Um, I've, I've not seen this myself, but Warang Theatre from Bali is a form of mass drama which has been unchanged for thousands of years. The actors perform uh, purification and protection rituals before wearing the masks to prevent complete possession uh, by the spirit. Once the mask is worn, the actors are believed to gain supernatural powers and when they dance, every eye movement, foot placement, body position, that's an expression of the spirit that's possessing them. So we can take a, a deflationary point of view on some kinds of, of spirit possession. Um, spirit possession happens when an individual acts a role under the belief that they're not acting. So, for example... A shaman is, a, is acting as a bear, but they believe they're not. They believe they are a bear, or, or a bear spirit at least. And so from this point of view, the reality of, of spirit possession isn't really that mysterious, even if the actual experience of it could be quite um, dramatic. And it's, and it's common and universal because we are precisely the kind of beings that do become possessed by alternate identities. That's the kind of, thing, kind of animals that we are. So if, if, we, if we accept this point of view, Sorry. Uh, then what really needs explaining isn't, isn't really spirit possession, but the recent emergence of modern subjects like us who no longer believe in it. So the denial of the reality of spirit possession you know, is axiomatic for modern scientific worldview. And certainly there's, there's no reasons to believe in the existence of supernatural entities. Yet, that there are plenty of things that exist 
that kind of float free from mundane physical reality. Things like ideas, theories, social structures and social roles, economic laws. These are not incorporeal spirits, but neither are these straightforwardly um, corporeal tables and chairs. And what we are, our personal identity, is, is shaped by these kinds of invisible things. And so Marx used the phrase character mask to describe people acting out uh, constrained social roles, you know, such as worker or capitalist. Because our social relations production produce specific kinds of people and they produce specific kinds of personality types and social roles. Yet most modern subjects of capitalism, because they live in societies dominated by a commercial culture, they believe that their personal identity is their personal property. It's something that they control as they please. Something they have. It's theirs. But I think this is hubris. Because we don't freely choose or control our personal identity. Instead, our identity is partly produced by something else, something bigger than us, um, something, um, something external. So, like Socrates, we also have our own inner voices, not of divine, but of alien origin that warn us when we're going wrong. It's the kind of voice that nags us to work harder and longer, either to impress the boss or avoid being laid off. It's the voice of that which controls the whip. But many of us just typically don't believe that. We tend to think that all of the inner voices are our own. So that means that we also act out roles under the belief that we're not acting. And in this sense, all of us are possessed by the spirit of our age. Okay.